Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and thank you for uh, allowing us to run over a little. There was some good conversations happening we didn't want to interrupt. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the IIEA. Uh, very warm welcome to those of you who are able to join us here at our premises in Dublin, and indeed, hello and welcome to those who are joining online. Uh, I'm really delighted to welcome you to Space, a new frontier for Ireland. I'm really happy we have found the space in our programme for this event. Um, want to welcome everybody, but specifically an old colleague is back. Nisha Kenny is here in the room and he helped uh, pull together this event. He's now moved on to different fields, but indeed it was his idea to have this event. So great to have you back, Nisha. Uh, he's now moved on to the Department of Foreign Affairs. I'm absolutely delighted that Professor Jane Souter, um, Professor of Political Communications at DCU, Director of the DCU Institute of Future Media, Democracy and Society, and Head of Research for the Irish Citizens Assembly is able to chair. Thank you very much, uh, Jane, for being with us and for supporting the, the work of the Institute. Jane is going to introduce the panellists. But before that, we're really thrilled that we finally have found a berth for Professor Neil Richmond to speak with us. Neil is the uh, Minister of State at the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment and is responsible for many things up to and including space. So, Neil, very warm welcome. And if you'd be good enough to give us some opening remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Barry, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I think you just promoted me from minister to professor, um, which I think would scare the life out of Jane, to be honest, if I was going to join as one of her colleagues. Uh, but Barry, I'm, I'm really delighted um, to come to what I think is a new frontier for the IIEA as well, this topic. And I think it's brilliant uh, to have the opportunity to introduce something uh, so brilliant. Um, Look, politics, and I'll say, Ambassador, you might agree with this, sometimes it's very hard to convince your teenage nieces and nephews that you've got an interesting job, um, cynical enough as they are. Bringing them to open a pennies was a good start, but then telling them that you're the Minister for Space uh, is definitely something I wasn't expecting when I was very lucky to be appointed this position back in January. But you're going to hear some amazing remarks from some amazing people shortly. And I just wanted to set the scene a little bit from a government point of view, from a policy point of view, indeed from an investment point of view. A number of you in the audience, and I've no doubt even more watching online, will be very familiar with the topics which I touch on. But I think it's important to set the scene. And uh, to the panel, um, I'm obviously daunted by your intelligence and expertise, but that's quite regular for me, so that's okay. Um, but beyond that, uh, I'm really looking forward to um, listening back in, because unfortunately, the diversity of my brief meant I spent this morning with Gordon Ramsay in Wicklow. I am um, joining you here for my lunch this afternoon and then I travel straight to Killarney to ha hand out health and safety awards to 600 people at a black tie banquet. Um, so unfortunately I won't be able to stay for the full discussion but I can assure you having shared many a panel and indeed a studio with Jane, um, be on your guard, she's ruthless. No, I'm only joking. Uh, you couldn't you couldn't have chosen a better chair, Barry, and it's always great uh, to be here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been an exciting uh, few years for space in Ireland with Irish technology being part of many of the recent international in initiatives, such as the JUICE mission and the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. At a national level, we will soon be launching Ireland's very first satellite, AirSat-1. This is an amazing achievement, not just because it was developed and built in my own constituency in UCD, where I was able to visit and get a look at and not a hold. And can I just take a moment? here that I have never been so frightened in my life than going into the clean room in UCD where right in front of me was a satellite and I was fully garbed up and behind me was 25 of the most intelligent people I've ever met in my life looking through the gas saying if he ruins my life work for a selfie that he's going to put on Instagram I'm going to kill him um but it was brilliant and the people behind that the full team of physicists, engineers, academics, it's been a monumental achievement. Uh, I really, and I mean this sincerely, and I'm, this is, I make lots of facetious comments and take the mick occasionally, but when I say that we have to put this satellite on a stamp, we have to get every single primary school child in Ireland dialed in to watch this launch. This is something that could be the start of something really special. What has gone into that, the effort that has gone into this is truly amazing. And the fact that we are launching our first satellite is just something that I, I am absolutely in awe of the people behind it. And I'm truly excited by it. I genuinely mean that. And it's something I hope would transcend politics and everything else. But though we are launching our first satellite, Ireland's interest in space is nothing new. It was actually in 1975 when we joined the European Space Agency. Even then, we knew that membership could help Irish companies to develop innovative space-related technologies. In the near, near 40 years, 
I'd say closer to 50 years since our continued investment in the European Space Agency, coupled with growing investment by the European Union in space, has ensured that Ireland and Irish businesses are very well placed to benefit from the rapid growth of the space industry. To ensure we are best placed to take advantage of this growth, Government Ireland, Government launched Ireland's first ever national space strategy for enterprise in 2019, which aims to support the industry and deliver a quality jobs as a result. So what have we achieved to date? Well, the number of Irish companies who have secured contracts with the European Space Agency has grown from 60 in 2017 to 97 in 2022. It's important to stress that these businesses are extremely advanced using all extremely sophisticated technology and cre creating extremely good, well-paying, well-qualified jobs. In fact, the value of these ESA contracts here in Ireland in 2022 alone was 13.5 million euro. This is exactly why investment in ESA is so important. We have committed to investing 125 million euro over the next five years. And I'm delighted that this week in budget 2024, we announced an additional 3.3 million euro funding for ESA, bringing its total allocation allocation to 20, uh, 26 million euro. And in 2019, when the strategy was first launched, funding was just 18 million euro. The increase in funding is a clear illustration of Ireland's commitment to the space sector. This investment is important on so many levels. Firstly, it sends a clear message to our friends in Europe that Ireland is a key player in the European space industry. But it also tells the space technology industry here in Ireland that we are firmly behind them. We want the industry to grow. We want to see more space research in Ireland. We want to see more Irish companies starting up and seizing the opportunities that this sector has to offer, both for their own sake, but also for society, for the environment, for research and for the economy. I had the opportunity to meet some of these businesses at an ESA Business Incubation Centre event in Nova UCD alongside Peter. And I was extremely impressed by the quality of ESA supported Irish companies who are developing innovative technologies, both for use in outer space, but also more importantly for application here on earth. These are companies that are using satellites and space technology to improve the accessibility of our towns, making farms more efficient and improving transport flows. I was able to see myself the impact that our investment in ESA is having not only to our economy, but in supporting these mainly young entrepreneurs and helping them gain further capital investment. While I've touched on the significant opportunities for Ireland with the space sector, it would be remiss of me to ignore the geopolitical context and security concerns that come alongside this. Just as we face a complex and challenging security environment on Earth, space is also becoming increasingly contested. This is where our involvement in ESA becomes even more important. I firmly believe that we are stronger when we work together on a European level and space is simply no different. The EU space strategy for security and defense reflects that there is a heightened awareness of the vulnerabilities associated with space. This is all the more important in a context where our activity in space is increasingly crucial for our economy and our society. With more and more Irish companies getting involved in this area, we need to ensure their work is protected. Ireland plays our full part here. We have to. We have an active role both through Space Working Party uh, meetings and the Space Competitiveness Council, which I attend. And we are involved in UN processes working to ensure the exclusivity, exclusively peaceful use of space, ensure it is not militarized and that there is equitable access to space resources. This is work that absolutely will be continued. In fact, in just a few weeks, I'll be attending a joint EU ESA meeting in Seville, where I'll meet my European counterparts to discuss how space activities can both support our economies, but also help us with our decarbonisation and climate goals. As someone who spent five years talking about Brexit, it's nice to have something different to talk on a European scale. Um, but I will, won't lie, the, whilst the opportunities are truly exciting and monumental, um, the risks are scary and they're a lot scarier than trusted traders and alternative arrangements, I can tell you that, Jane. Um, to finish, I'd like to emphasise that this is a really exciting time for space and in particular the space industry in Ireland with Irish companies well placed to take a greater share of the sp global space market. Between the rise in Irish involvement in space technology and our pending satellite launch, this is a great time to have this discussion. I'm really genuinely so grateful that you gave me a few minutes just to lay out exactly how serious and how important the Irish government believe this sector is. Um, I have deliberately um, avoided using any laboured space puns, unlike Barry, because I think that really takes away from the opportunities that are going on here. If I was to say it, Barry, it's perfectly acceptable for you to say it, um, because it was quite funny, um, but I'd made a hand-fisted job of it. But more importantly, I really want to lay out the 97 companies that have engaged with ESA are just the tip of the iceberg. 
there is so much greater opportunity um, from an economic point of view. And I say that as a minister of the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment, but how that can benefit um, research, academia, and how that can really seep into the classrooms across the country, I think is really groundbreaking. So we're going to invest more money over the next few years. We're going to put more emphasis on it, and we're going to bring more Irish people home to do more work in this area. But I'll leave the panel to perhaps touch on those topics a little bit more. Barry, thank you so much as ever. Thank you very much to Alex White as ever for all the work the IIA do. And just before I close, this is the first time I've had the opportunity to be in this building um, a number of years ago since the passing of Brendan Halligan. It would be remiss of me not to acknowledge him. For any of you who are friends of the IIA or who have been involved in, in Irish public affairs at any stage over the last 50 years, you will have a fair idea of just what a massive impact he had not just in the European Parliament, not just in the Oireachtas, but far more importantly, his work, particularly when I got to know him over the last 10 or 15 years in the public discourse space has been monumental. And uh, I just want to take a moment to say that. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the discussion. Uh, thank you, Minister. That, that, was, uh, that was great. Very welcome. And uh, I'm sure everybody... Welcome to the promises of future investment and, uh, and more jobs. So I'm pleased to welcome you all here today for the discussion at the IIEA and delighted to be joined by uh, Sinead O'Sullivan here from the Harvard's Business School in Institute for Strategy and Competitiveness, um, Peter Smith, who's the Commercial Director at Tyndall, and Rory Fitzpatrick, CEO of the National Space Centre. And thank you all for being so generous to give up your uh, your time today. So each of our panelists are going to speak for between 10 and 15 uh, minutes, and then we'll get to Q&A with all of you, our audience here, and all of those who've uh, joined us online. So for those of you uh, in the room, you'll be able to join the discussion, just put up your hand and you'll get a mic and just introduce yourselves and any affiliation you have. And uh, just to make sure that everybody gets a, an opportunity to speak, please keep your questions or comments reasonably succinct. And uh, for all of you joining us online, welcome. And you can, of course, join the discussion using the Q&A function, and this will appear here. So please just put in your questions as they occur to you during the session. Thank you. And just a reminder to everybody that uh, everything today is uh, on the record. And for any of you who are still on Twitter or X, um, it's at IIEA. So I'll introduce uh, Sinead to you first and then hand over to her. Uh, so Sinead has like the most amazing resume. She leads strategy at Harvard's Business School at the Institute for Strategy and Competitiveness with Professor Michael Porter. Uh, but on top of that, she's also a professor of aerospace engineering at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, she's formerly a, a research fellow at MIT's College of Computing and MIT Sloan, as well as a human spaceflight mission designer for NASA and Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, her work focuses on the intersection of technology, innovation, geopolitics and defense. So, wow. Uh, she is on the board of the European Space Policy Institute and has advised over one billion of space technology investment and M&A transactions. So welcome, Sinead. We're all absolutely thrilled that you were able to join us here today. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. This is my first time in this building. It's lovely to be here. I was asked last night if I had slides and the answer was no. And then I was like, oh, maybe I do. Um, so apologies. <laughs> it shouldn't go on for more than an hour. <laughs> please cut me off if it goes on too long um you know I thought it might be interesting to kind of think about the role of of Ireland and the role of the government and so you know these are some of the slides that I've taken from I teach a class in the business and economics of space and so um there's about 600 slides for that class we've got about three of them here um it would be remiss of me not to, to look at what the government has done and how the space sector really started, which was a public sector industry. And there are some amazing, um, amazing missions that have, the, that have come from the, the public sector. So, you know, I think some of the rhetoric today is kind of that the public sector is useless at doing innovation. It's too slow. It's too expensive. 
but historically, you know, looking at that diagram is a great reminder of, of what the public sector has historically been able to achieve. Um, moving forward, one of the most important innovations that we've seen come out of the space sector really came out of NASA's ability to move from cost plus contracting through to fixed price. Um, you know, the idea initially was to move uh, from government as the only customer to government as is one of many customers. Now, I don't, I, how does this little thing work? Ah, there we go. Okay, it doesn't go on the screen. I don't think we're quite there. We're definitely moving in the direction. Um, we are very much at the stage now where government is the anchor tenant, uh, which I'll discuss in a few minutes, but provides some interesting interaction between public and private sector. Um, Okay, so the public private sector today, it really is a mix of both. You can find this graph uh, online, you know, roughly $400 billion global space economy. This graph is about a year old. Anything in this in this kind of top left uh, quadrant, the, the brownie orangey color, really is looking at the government DOD um, or the US government budget and then also non-US government budgets. Um, interestingly here, this is kind of what I think about this emerging interaction between public and private sector. And, you know, traditionally this is this is what would have been self-contained within the, the DOD or the government. And now we're starting to see that these the spending is being um, delivered through private contracts. Those private contracts are the real reason why we're starting to see the growth of private sector uh, companies in this space. I mean, this graph is really interesting for a million different reasons. Um, when I teach, you know, we might spend a week on this graph alone. But interestingly, if you look, and it's a pity that it doesn't work on the screen, it's really hard to see the launch services in there. Uh, and people are always really surprised because there's so much noise about SpaceX and launch, um, just how small it is of the global space economy. Extremely important, but very small. Um, something that could be a much longer conversation. So looking at where we are now, the growth of private financing that is really moving and helping NASA and other um, government agencies move into kind of more private pu public um, contracting. Interestingly, from this graph, you can see, you know, one of the big changes over time is this big blue column, which is venture capital. And that's kind of, you know, the sexy hot topic that, that people have been talking about for the last few years. Um, I just want to highlight quickly a couple of things. I was thinking about this morning that I actually hadn't noticed before that I think are quite interesting. Kind of hard to see on the screen because the, <laughs> it's like, you know, what not to do in a presentation. Uh, the colors all look the same, but I'll describe it to you in case you can't see. So um, in, in, in um, 2013 and 2014, the non-blue colors, there's actually quite a bit of private equity activity happening in the space industry. And I remember that at the time because that's kind of when I moved into uh, the space uh, space financing because for the first time there's you know kind of this big large amount of private sector uh, private equity financing. After that, there's a massive rise in venture capital, but interestingly, there's a lot lower amount of private equity happening in the industry. And then if you look at the last column in 2020, the the bubble at the top or the column at the top is public offerings. Most of those are SPACs. So when I was thinking about it this morning, I really thought about the fact that. There was a lack of private equity activity recently, followed by this kind of bubble of um, IPOs. And to me, that asks one of the questions, one of the questions that it asks is private equity financing really goes after maturing companies that are moving into reliable revenue, uh, reliable growth, sustainable, um, I guess, sustainable market growth not seeing private equity activity actually should be quite concerning in those in those um in in the last few years which to me indicates you know one of the questions we should be asking within the community is have we provided a way for venture capital uh to create companies that leads to more reliable structured sustainable growth and and the big bubble of SPACs at the end um suggests potentially not um the other thing that we've seen, which this is amazing, actually, this graph, this came from Seraphim in 2021. I think if you look at this now, it's going to be, you know, twice the size of this. I, If you look at the entire value chain of the space industry, there, there isn't, I mean, I, you could look at like a really weird, tiny, small part of 
um, the space industry, you won't see any part of it that doesn't have a ton of different startups going after it, uh, which is great because that suggests that the private sector uh, financing has really created this ecosystem um, of really strong deal flow um, in the industry, which is fantastic. So that's one of the hardest things to do in an ecosystem that you're trying to grow is to get that really, really strong uh, deal flow that could be financed. And each of those deals, you know, I've probably seen most of those deals um, come with a really strong team of engineers, a really strong team of business development personnel. Um, a lot of those have kind of spun out from earlier SpaceX employees. Um, and there's, there, there's a flywheel for sure. We're seeing a ton of really, really, really great founders now in the space. So where are we today? Well, the future is certainly different to the past. It would be impossible to think about the growth of uh, venture capital and private equity in the space industry without looking at interest rates and uh, bond yields. Um, for people who are not um, immediately able to tell what's happening in this graph, um, I can explain it as the interest rate, um, I guess low or no interest rates over the last 15 years have uh, pushed the price or the yields of bonds down. People trying to attract or chase yields have moved money into higher risk uh, asset classes. And those are predominantly private equity and venture capital. So why, if I'm in the space industry, do I care about this graph? Uh, the, big, the big thing is that I have to look at the industry at the minute and try to figure out one of two things. Is it growing because there is a really strong fundamental um, use case of these technologies in the space industry and the, the dynamics of the industry are growing from a fun fundamental perspective or has there been an allocation of capital to the industry because it's looking for something such as high yields? And so that's an important question because thinking about moving forward, we know that the future is not going to look like this. We know that interest rates are higher now than they used to be, um, depending on the flavor of economists you speak to. Um, they may stay high for a while. And so what does that mean for the space industry moving forward? Well, understanding the sensitivity of the ecosystem today relative to interest rates is actually really important. Are people investing in the industry because of the really strong fundamentals, in which case the industry is very robust to economic um, impact, or was there capital allocation there because of low interest rates? Um, and so I think we are really at a very important point in the industry today because we're, we're gonna see in real time, and I think we're starting to see that actually capital is moving quite quickly out of the space industry um, and that some of the deals that were maybe done this time last year or two years ago would not be done uh, today. And we're seeing valuation uh, write-offs and drawdowns of 80%. So I think this is something to consider when thinking about how to sustain, but also grow the industry moving forward. How can we make it more robust? Um, how robust is it today? And what do we need to do to strengthen the space economy? Um, kind of in line with that, what we're seeing today also are revising of historical predictions. So, you know, one of the narratives that came out of the last 10 years is that the low cost of launch is going to kind of create this you know, massive uh, number of new industries being created in space because everyone, everything is going to be launched into space. Um, actually, if you remove Starlink from, from that, you see that we have, you know, despite costs of launch uh, being reduced 10x, we've probably only seen a 2x increase. Uh, in the number of launches. Again, this, this is something that we could, this data point, we could use to think about what is the size of the industry going to be in 10 years time, in 20 years time, or even tomorrow. Um, a lot of analysts are revising historical predictions on the size and the speed of growth of the industry. Um, one of my favorite things about what happened last week, if, if people haven't heard about it, is that the FCC in the US launched uh, or or find um, find a company for basically not having disposed of their space trash properly. Um, the market reaction to that suggests that the government is still very much in the lead when it comes to uh, the growth of the private sector space economy. So I think you know over the last few years we have heard again a lot of rhetoric around the fact that venture capitalism, private equity, private space. Uh, 
uh, companies are actually driving the industry. What happened last week shows me very clearly that the government um, has at its disposable at, at its disposal the ability to direct the movement and the flow of that capital very quickly by indicating very strongly uh, certain policy or certain um, behavioral uh, dynamics of the industry that it wishes to see. So for example, um, finding space trash is a really good indicator for me that space sustainability is in fact going to be an industry that could potentially generate revenue. If I am an investor, I look at that and I think, great, my portfolio of space trash companies uh, is likely to do pretty well. So we're kind of back to where we started in certain ways. Yes, there has been a massive transition to private sector, but uh, simultaneously, we are still seeing that the government is very much in control of that. So what does that mean for Ireland? You know, we, we heard the minister discuss there that, that, you know, Irish investing in space is going to continue. I would argue um, that investing is only one really, really small tool that the government has. As we've seen, the government has many other tools um, at its disposal that it can use to indicate uh, and to move markets and to, to move potentially uh, much higher efficient, higher efficiency capital uh, to different parts of the space economy. So the Irish government, um, you know, being part of the European Space Agency has the ability to use other regulatory and uh, non-regulatory tools, not just capital. And I think that's going to be probably one of the biggest drivers of the, the growth of the private space sector, especially for Europe in the next, in the next few years. Sorry if that was long. Thank you. I think that's it. Yeah. That's great. Thanks so much, Ned. Really interesting. Um, so next, uh, I'm going to introduce Peter here to my left. So Peter Smith is the commercial director at Tyndall, uh, where he's responsible for industry engagement strategy and operations. Um, but he's based at the Institute's Dublin office. Um, he's a chief executive of 30 years experience in uh, the business of technology, translating customer needs into commercial return. And before joining Tyndall, he was founder and CEO of a number of uh, tech startups and was an executive of technology IP firm, is it SIVA? Yeah, um, at the time of its IPO. Uh, he's an electronic engineering graduate of uh, my institution, DCU, and has had senior uh, sales and product management positions while living in Ireland, the UK, the US and Germany. So welcome, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity. It's my first time also in the building um, and it's great to be on the panel. So for anyone who doesn't know who Tyndall is, the Tyndall National Institute is the National ICT Research Center. Um, in scale, we're about 650 people uh, as a research community. Um, on a growth trajectory to 850, uh, approximately doubling in size actually over the period of, of the strategy. Uh, we've had a long history with the space sector. Uh, I think it was last year we, we celebrated 40 years, um, initially starting as the NMRC and becoming Tyndall, but that's 40 years of deep technology research. And 35 of those have been with the European Space Agency. So there's a very great pedigree there. One of the things that Tyndall and other institutions like ours do as part of our remit is talent pipeline development. And there's a really nice story around talent pipeline um, in that the radiation detectors, which came out of Tyndall and are flying on the space station and used at CERN, were the subject of Dr. Anne Kelleher's um, PhD from Tyndall. And uh, Dr. Kelleher now leads all of Intel's global uh, technology development. So it, it's really, really important that that environment continues, that it's well supported, that the, um, the talent pipeline develops out of the, the deep technology research. We also had the consortium for the European Space Agency, ESA BIC, which is a business incubation, incubation environment for uh, early stage companies, along with our partners in Maynooth University, Nova UCD, and uh, Technological University of the Shannon. Um, that's a really important activity as well for us because it brings us into the startup and um, early stage company development for uh, space technology. 
we're also very, very interested in the semiconductor landscape. So nothing goes to space or operates in space. Nothing you do on a daily basis almost can be done without semiconductors. So the emergence of the CHIPS Acts in the US and uh, Europe um, is, is a really seminal moment, actually. Very, very uh, significant shift uh, in the, uh, the strategy around semiconductors. So we feel that part of our role is to inform our stakeholders in government, our government agencies, and work with our European uh, collaboration partners to advance uh, the uh, the profile um, and the st strategy development for semiconductors in Europe. So deep technology, actually, Jane, you asked me earlier, what's deep tech? It's fundamental advances in science and engineering. And what's really interesting is in space, they go hand in hand, right? So nothing ever happened in, in relation to space development without that fundamental research uh, activity uh, taking place. So it's it's really important um, that we recognize that. If you look at all of the technology that is currently dominating space, uh, it started with comms, right? And let, let's just be frank about you know satellite comms and um, uh, sky boxes and all the rest, right? You know, um, that was the early stage, but now, look at what it's doing in relation to biodiversity, sustainability, climate action. So it really is part of our lives uh, in, in a very serious way. And, and um, we need to recognize that. In terms of the funding opportunities that exist for, um, for such deep technology, um, actually Ireland is pretty good in relation to uh, tapping into the, the funding opportunities. Uh, available through the European Space Agency, the um, the EU, and of course, national programs. And I would pick out DTIF, the Disruptive Technology Innovation Fund from Enterprise Ireland, which is a, a Department of Enterprise initiative. Um, that's incredibly important because it ties the supply chain together. So you, you can have large multinationals working with small SMEs, and that allows the smaller companies to introduce themselves into that value chain. One last thing about deep technology is that we have found that it's very sticky in a commercial sense. So it's highly differentiated. It's, it usually follows five, 10, 15 years of, of pure research and that creates differentiated products. And therefore what you find is that companies who are involved in the space from startup to, to scaling does something like an 85% um, survival rate, which is pretty amazing. That's certainly the case in Ireland and is reflected across the world as well. It's very interesting looking at your graphs, Sinead. One of the things that is very, very obvious is the uh, expansion in the number of patents associated with space technology. So over the last 10 years, uh, there has been phenomenal growth and that's very positive. There are people obviously looking at the opportunities that exist in the, the space market and uh, taking uh, precautionary measures essentially to, uh, uh, to ensure that their technology is pr protected through patents. But that brings me on then just to mention the importance of uh, policy advocacy strategy. Um, we have a situation at the moment where uh, in relation to uh, patents particularly, um, there is an initiative to have a unified approach to uh, patents um, across uh, Europe, and Ireland has been a major supporter of that um, uh, development of, of a new court system effectively for uh, patents. And um, while we have supported it, we haven't yet moved to ratify it. So government has a really important role to play in relation to ensuring that on the um, policy side that we follow through and support everything that's required uh, from a, um, uh, a strategy perspective and implementing um, policy for us. I would point out that there's actually a, a strong uh, policy group across Europe, um, which was launched last year. The, uh, there is a, a university RTO organization called EARTO, E-A-R-T-O, uh, and that's a, a policy and advocacy group for uh, research organizations in Europe. But last year, um, a space specific um, sector uh, broke out from that organization in one of the best branding moves I've ever seen because it's called the Astro, um, dealing specifically with, uh, with the space technology. But that's a really important network essentially of all of the technology um, uh, RTOs uh, across Europe um, coming together through that uh, activity and Tyndall is um, is a, a founding member of that organization. So we try to stay very close to all of that. 
all of what we do um, from a, a, a um, strategy perspective, from our point of view, um, I was asked, why does uh, Tyndall as a, a research organization have a commercial function? It's because we believe part of our remit is to make sure that the research is translated into value in, in, uh, in the economy. Um, and, and on that basis, uh, we're very, very active in that area. Um, in, in the question of public versus private, my sense would be that, of course, um, public investment continues, um, but most of the private organizations, as you said, are more or less being funded um, by the public sector as well in terms of uh, technology development. So the, I think that they will um, continue hand in hand. Um, it will expand. Uh, we are in, uh, in Ireland alone. We're in a position of massive growth. Over the last 10 years, I think if you looked at Irish owned companies operating in the space sector, I think it was around 17 or 18, that number is now well over 50. So you've seen a more than tripling of the activity of Irish owned um, space active companies during that period of time. Uh, recently, um, there's been a great initiative with the formation of the Irish Space Association. Um, and what that's now doing is providing the private sector focus on the networking required for the value chain, uh, working together from a research perspective, a policy perspective, and developing the strategy overall. And I'd probably leave the, um, the discussion with the, uh, the final remark that um, when you look at someone like the, uh, the Irish Space Association, it's really, really important that uh, all of the uh, government stakeholders and private industry come together. Uh, I was lucky enough to be involved in, uh, the minister mentioned the development of the uh, space strategy for industry uh, launched in 2019. That will come to end of life. We have to make sure that there's momentum. We have to make sure that all of the parties are working together to put a strategy in place. I think actually that's a third uh, pillar um, to what government can do, and that is to provide clear direction through strategy development uh, to in, in order to ensure essentially that we have a thriving research ecosystem, which is then supporting a thriving industry ecosystem. So um, with that, I think I um, segue actually into someone who really is involved on in the industry side on the panel. Okay, thanks so much, Peter. Uh, very welcome. So yes, uh, our next speaker is uh, Rory, Rory Fitzpatrick. Uh, he's the CEO of the National Space Centre, which is a world-class carrier-grade commercial teleport and centre for space research and development. So uh, Rory's a 20-year veteran of the satellite communications industry and a strong proponent of Ireland's enterprise culture, um, as well as the ability of the Irish space sector to stimulate economic growth and lead development of space technologies with both space and terrestrial applications. So hopefully you'll tell us more about how we can do that, Rory. Um, well, it's it's funny listening to the minister earlier on talking about the intelligence in the room. Um, and it is it is great fun because the last exam I passed, I think, was my junior cert. So <laughs> it's kind of, I am usually dealing with people that are a lot more qualified than me. But we're lucky that we've got a great team that are very, very good on site. Um, it's funny, like when you look at the industrial side, I left Ireland when I was 18 and Cork was like totally knocked out. There's no work. We all headed away, worked in building sites, hotels and everything else. And I got into publishing in the UK and started my own company when I was about 27 and then bought and sold a few companies. Ended up coming back to Ireland in 97 because I met my wife and she dragged me back. And I ended up starting getting involved in technology here then. Now that led me to taking over and um, ending up setting up the National Space Centre Limited, I have to be very careful here, not a government agency, we're a private company. Um, and we took over and bought the old air teleport down in Middleton. And this was originally set up to transfer telephone data from Europe to America. And it's a very important thing because this is something that had nothing to do with state policy. It was a European initiative to, to communicate between Europe and America. And we just ended up with it luckily happening in, in Ireland. Um, now, we took it over and we've operated and we've dealt with a lot of the top space companies in the world. We've had Utilsat, SES Astra, Telenor, a lot of the big satellite owners operators. We've had recently a lot of the LEO operators. 
state agencies, um, uh, people like SpaceX recently, and um, we have two other LEO operators on site. Um, we've got Exact Earth, Rocket Labs, Leap Space, Contech. All these are big space companies. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning them is because we were an EI-funded company. And uh, they supported us 13 years ago, and that got us into the business. And we've more or less made profit for the last, over the last 13 years, we've made profit for 10 of those years. And that has been off purely commercial contracts. And that's gone out there winning contracts internationally from uh, against, mainly the UK would be our biggest competitor. So we're winning contracts against teleports in the UK. Um, the nearest thing I had to an actual proper job was the Air Corps. My grandfather wanted me to join the Air Corps when I was young because he was an Air Corps guy. Um, if I realized how snazzy the uniforms are, I might have joined. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I ended up going into industry in the UK. And, and it's fascinating. When you look, your slides are really interesting. When you look at the ecosystem, and this is where we come from an Irish perspective here. Um, the government can support research and that can lead to interesting spin-outs. Um, like John and myself have been involved in, in the industry for 10, well, 20 years, but 10, 13 years in the space sector specifically. And if you look at this, um, a lot of the stuff coming down the line, it, it does go back to government. NASA, all the original stuff would have been government. And when you look at space, we think of the moon and Mars and all this kind of stuff. But the reality of most of the industry in space right now is actually sensors looking down. It's military, it's surveillance, it's point-to-point -point contact, it's uh, your sat-nav in your car. It's your communications systems that you're using. The, the amount of technology that we're getting, like the weather report, a small thing. When you look at the Fastnet race in 79, so many people killed, such a disaster. Nowadays, it would be really, really, really difficult for that to happen because we have so many sensors up there looking down. We can see the weather weeks in advance. And this is a really, really big deal. We can see tidal flows. We can see heat signatures. The amount of stuff that we're getting, the amount of access every single government department has now from space is phenomenal. And that's where the actual industry in space. So when we look at this from a commercial perspective, it, these companies are making money now. People are paying to be on the apps. Those apps are paying the satellite companies. The satellite companies are paying the launch companies. So we have a commercial ecosystem that is starting to really churn. Um, the other thing that's a huge issue in the expanding system right now is the ability to fail. The big difference between government and between private enterprise is we can fail. If NASA are launching, if they fail, you have a government inquiry, you have everyone dragged up in front of them. How did it fail? You need reports, you need witnesses. They, I was lucky, I was at Gwen Shotwell, she runs SpaceX. So Musk takes all the credit, but she actually operates the company and runs it. And she got inducted into the Hall of Fame in America a couple of years ago. And we were at the thing and she, it was the best presentation I've ever seen. She had the a classical bit of music. Um, I forget which song, but it was da 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 da, you know, this, this song and rockets exploding. 52 rockets exploded in her presentation, right? And she said, the reason we were able to get the two landing together is because we were able to blow up 52 rockets. Mm -hmm. Now that's an acceleration. Now you look at SpaceX and when you look at where we are right now, Ireland, we're really lucky. We have a very high technical education due to our establishments, uh, our educational system. We have really good technology people. We have American companies in here who have all the space companies and a lot of technology. And we have an absolutely exploding space industry. Right now, SpaceX, just to give you an idea of the numbers, SpaceX have put up 6,000, roughly 6,000 satellites out of a planned 12,000, right? Kuiper are launching very shortly. Their first two satellites went up last week. We've Telesat after getting funding to put up another fleet of satellites. And that's before we even start looking at the Indians, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Russians. They'll all be putting up their own networks. Most of this is for internet and for internet of things. So this is all commercial, hardcore, steady business. We can be doing a lot of this with the universities and research, with private companies making the money. So, so the opportunity for Ireland is vast. Um, from government policy, once we don't end up being on the wrong side of a policy decision or a legislation issue to compete, we're, we're quids in. We compete an awful lot with teleports all over Europe. Our technical staff are better than most. Our work ethic is better than most. Our prices, while there is a price issue, we're not the cheapest. We're certainly not the most expensive. And we can liaise and sell and work very, very well with them. We have a good culture for dealing with people. And um, just to give you an example, I won't name the countries, but there's countries in Europe where our American partners went to install a satellite dish and they were told that they'd worked too many hours that week and they had to go home. 
Now, telling an American that you can't work is kind of like, you know, what? <laughs> you know, not, a, not a lot of work. So this is a thing that Ireland has a big advantage structurally over the rest of Europe with. And it's a very big advantage. So I think going forward for us on the commercial side, we've got about three or four projects coming up. There's a couple of big, big issues. And you, you touched on the venture capital. Funding in Ireland is very, very, very difficult. And the reason why is our banking system is small. It doesn't have spare capacity to take flutters. It's generally looking at things from a property-based perspective. So unless there's a fixed income and a lot of the funding that is available right now, if you can show that you have a guaranteed income, which means either it's a big, huge blue chip American company or it's a government department, if you can guarantee the feedback in income from that, you can get funding. Anything that you can't guarantee, forget funding. So it's very, very difficult to get venture capital and to get funding into the sector at the moment. You're better off actually chasing contracts and making the money yourself. That's easier than getting funding for the sector at the moment. So I think when you look at the funding, European Space Agency funding is fantastic, and it's brilliant at allowing us to develop new technology, new tools and stuff like that. But what it doesn't do is give you operational money. It doesn't allow you rollout. And that's, that's the really big gap Ireland has. Um, I think our challenge, if you look at where we are at the moment, we have a massive amount of foreign direct investment from the States, which really is working very well for the country. That's not going to last indefinitely. At some point, as we harmonize with Europe, the tax will have to harmonize. And that our, our, all our windfall money that we're getting at the moment will be into a European pot instead of into ours. In the meantime, we need to become self-sufficient. And that is the big challenge for government here, I think, is to, to build infrastructure and build industry here so that it can actually stand on its own when the European stuff changes. So I, I think from our perspective, we're very excited. We're, we're enjoying what we do. Um, Ireland is doing an amazing job of punching, like the rugby, we're punching well above, above our weight at the moment for the amount of money and population and everything else. And it's um, I'm looking forward to this weekend and possibly maybe sneaking to Paris if my wife will let me for uh, the final. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Rory. I think we'll all join you for the final if we can get there. Um, so can I ask first, do, do any of the panellists have any questions or comments for uh, any of the others, anything you'd like to say in response to anybody yes, before uh, we move on? I, I would like to emphasize something that Rory talked about. So, yeah. Um, you mentioned spin outs, you know, early stage, and uh, that's really, really important. Uh, and, it, and it works, you know, um, we can be dynamic. That's we don't have any of the major primes here. Right. So it, it, it's all about actually uh, being swift and dynamic and adapting to the, the landscape. Uh, and, and we have good to be honest, we have good government agencies in Enterprise Ireland and IDA as, as partners to try and make that happen. Um, the ISIF probably has a, a role to play in that area as well, I would say. But I would also say that while while we can be dynamic and we we can move, it's moving very quickly, right? So uh, I think the the lines are being drawn for technology development of this kind and success in a marketplace very, very quickly. And we need to be nimble. We need to follow through and be fast about it. There, there is one thing on, on the, when we started, we first went to Enterprise Ireland and it's he's retired now, but he 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 really helped us an awful lot in the bidding and Tony MacDonald and Barry uh, Fennell. They, they were instrumental and they were involved in a lot of the first companies in Ireland as indigenous Irish space companies. Um, but it takes a long time, like from the stuff that they start, it takes a long time for that roll through. But the biggest single advantage we have as in with that with Enterprise Ireland as an agency is that everywhere I went in the world to sell. When I went to California, when I went to New York, when I went everywhere, they'd ring the local office and the local office would get in touch with the key players and line up meetings. It, it's a thing that we think it's normal because of the way we operate, but this is not usual in other countries. They don't do that. This is a really, so for anyone that's interested in starting companies in, in the space sector, use the network. It's been like gold dust for us. I would hit on a couple of, yeah. Um, that, I mean, that's, generally one of the pros of being Irish, you have an embassy or a pub in every city. <laughs> Not even every city, like no literally in every township, um, which I've used a few of. Um, I think, you know, it, it's nearly impossible to have this conversation without talking about, you know, the, the elephant in the room, especially when talking about funding. Um, and this week, really, it's has been a difficult one because it, it really brings it home. But 
you cannot talk about the space industry without talking about the defense industry. Um, that creates tension in Europe because the D word defense is a dirty word. When I sit in board meetings in Europe and I say the word defense, people, I see a physical recoil. Um, but space technologies are dual use technologies, you know, hypersonics, supersonics, re-entry vehicles. Um, and so one of, one of the main reasons why it's so hard, not only in Ireland, but I've had conversations with Enterprise Ireland and um, ISIF or ISIF, whatever I'm gonna call them, they cannot under many regulatory um, frameworks invest in anything that is defense or defense adjacent. So one of the big problems that you actually find in Europe, and this is one of the big pieces of work I'm doing at the minute, is looking at why is there a lack of venture capital, private equity, potentially even pension funds or institutional investment into space technologies. And 99% of the problem is that asset managers, whether you're a venture capitalist or a private equity investor, cannot enter the space market because their investors are not allowed to invest in anything that is defense adjacent. And I had a long conversation with ISIF about this. Is there a way to delineate? What does that framework look like? And ultimately across Europe, a lot of the conversations you'll have will end in, we cannot get this through our ESG committee. So it's, it's worth noting when we talk about funding gaps, sometimes the capital is there. 99% of the time it's unallocatable to defense adjacent sectors. Um, you know, and you can talk about, well, earth, you know, earth observation and climate change, whatever, and it's a yes, but emissions, defense, hypersonics. So, so this is an unresolved conflict in the industry. And it's, 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 it is something that needs to be resolved if we want to start bringing early stage investments into the industry, especially in Ireland. I, I can't see it. Uh, like, if you look, this is a big area for us because we're right on the edge of this. Um, we have a lot of contracts we could be taking if we did defence. Um, uh, now, I separate Irish defence because we do work with the defence forces. Um, if we were to work for foreign defence companies, the difficulty we have is that, first of all, we don't have a security care system for private enterprise. Now, there, it's in the works and it's being dealt with. Um, the, this this is something that is is a a, a problem sometimes, um, but the, the the real problem is that we're not a NATO member, and um, I can't see this being resolved quickly because while the government are willing to deal with it, um, there is a commitment to a referendum, and I just don't see a referendum happening in the next five to ten years. Like maybe it'll happen between five and ten years, but that means that we're not going to end up changing our position from partners in peace to NATO. Um, whether we want to or not. And I think there's a national discussion going to happen about that. Um, there's an awful lot of pressure at the moment uh, coming from all angles for Ireland to harmonise with Europe and become part of NATO. But our own internal, just looking at our internal system, I, I just can't see how we can how that can, can be dealt with. Until that changes, we can't be part of a lot of the European um, prop full missions. Um, on the satellite side, like we were looking at one contract where we might open a company in France or in the UK to deal with a contract that we had the potential of doing. And instead, it looked at the cost of doing that. It wouldn't have worked out. So we just left it. Um, but, but that's the reality of where we are.